Amen. God is good. Turn in your Bibles this morning to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to be in verse 22. And let me just read a couple of verses to you. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. It starts off, Paul the Apostle writes, and he says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And the church says, amen. You know, this morning, I want to talk to every person, men, women, wives, husbands, marriage, but all of us, but primarily, I want to talk to, to the women. And the title of this message this morning is Becoming the Woman God Created You to Be. So as we have now entered into this last section of this great epistle by the Apostle Paul, uh, written from prison in Rome, you know, we now continue to learn what it really means to walk worthy of our calling. Remember, again, as I say every Sunday, uh, the word worthy is a, a picture, a word picture of a set of scales uh, to be perfectly balanced in your walk. You're equal in doctrine. You're equal in application. If, you're, if either of those are off, then you're not balanced. You're not having a worthy walk. And we've learned that we need to imitate God as dear children by walking in love and wisdom and walking in light. And now we're learning this morning about marriage and how to honor God in our marriage, the husband and the wife. So last Sunday, remember just a quick review we learn many different things. Primarily, though, the most important, we learn that the number one cause for Christian divorce is not the usual, the thing that we think about, like lack of no communication between the couples or uh, financial issues or adultery or whatever it might be. That's not the number one cause today for divorce or really any time among believers. The number one cause for divorce among Christians is doing marriage the couple, both of you, doing marriage your way instead of God's way. But there's only one way to do marriage, and that is God's way. Amen? He created marriage. He created the male and the female, and so forth. Remember that marriage, Christian marriage, is different from all marriages in the world. It's not a contract. It's a piece of paper doesn't make one flesh. You know, it is a covenant between a man and a woman in the eyes of Almighty God where he takes two unique individuals and makes them one flesh. Only God can do that. And then there are several scriptures. If we're going to have God's mar uh, marriage God's way, we have to apply uh, the couple, all Christians, but the couple in particular here this morning, Ephesians 5, 18, where it says, do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be ye being filled every day be ye being filled with the spirit which is a command from God not a suggestion and not an option now if the husband and wife if they don't practice verse 18 how are you going to be led by the spirit how are you going to walk in the spirit and and have a holy spirit led marriage that's what God wants you to have so a husband and wife a marriage that is committed and obedient to verse 18 will fulfill verse 21. Great scripture. Verse 21 is paramount. It is the foundation, loved one. Submitting yourselves one to another, and how do we do it? In the fear of Christ. That Listen, if a husband and wife, like I said last Sunday, if you do not believe with all of your heart and obey verse 21, there is absolutely no way you can practice verse 22 all the way down to verse 33. It's not going to work. It'll never work, okay? So that is a paramount scripture. Mutual submission, okay? And a mutual submission. It's not the wife's will. It's not the husband's will. But it's both of you say, all we want is God's will in our marriage, which is God's will is the word of God. Amen? So that's what we put into practice. And if you do marriage any other way than God's way, how can Jesus be the Lord of your marriage? How can you truly say, I fear Christ, I fear the Lord? You can't if Jesus is not the Lord. So this morning, as we look at the role of the wife and the role of the husband a little bit, uh, marriage God's way, this is so paramount, it's so important that for women, listen, 
You know, becoming the woman that God created you to be, verse 22. It says, wives, submit to your own husbands. And then it doesn't mean every man. Your own husband, literally from last Sunday, remember your own unique, beautiful possession. You're one flesh now. It says, uh, submit, your own, sit, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. So before we get into that deeper, uh, I want to do exactly what I did in the first service. How do wives submit, truly submit to their husband? Now, there's a lot of different views on that, and, uh, but the Bible is the only correct view. Amen? And, th and so, uh, you know, just to mess around just for a minute, I, I, wanna, to, I wrote this down yesterday afternoon before I left here as I was polishing this sermon up. Let me just read what I wrote about how do wives submit to their own husbands. Here it comes. Your husband arrives home from work. He's had a very hard day. And the men go, yes, Bill, that's true. Amen. You know exactly, wife, you know exactly what he needs. He needs to unwind. He arrives home and he immediately, he smells the aroma of rose petals that lay on the floor. Oh, the visual of that, his heart starts racing now. And he knows exactly what that means. He slowly follows the trail of the rose petals that you gently, that you lovingly placed on the floor before he arrived home. They lead your husband to his favorite place. He's been thinking about it all day long to his PlayStation 4 Pro. <laughs> it is there you gently kiss him. You encourage him to play his favorite video game as long as he desires, and you say, oh, honey, you look like you should play Call of Duty today. Oh, no, no, wait, because you look into his eyes and you say, oh, no, honey, no, mortal combat is what you need to relieve this stress. Of course, you, the wife, you just arrived home from work, but you don't need to unwind. No, you feel good. I sounded like nacho. You feel good. Never mind. You stopped at Kroger's and picked up a steak for dinner, but you also picked up the kids. You are wife. You are mother. You are woman. Now, when your husband is finished with his much-needed stress, rest. With great joy, you place his burnt offering, I mean dinner, <laughs> on the table for him. And you have even cut up his steak in the little chewable pieces. <laughs> the husband's going, come on, Bill, I love this, man. No, is that how you submit to your husband? No, that's insanity, amen? Listen, submit is a love word. It says, unto the Lord, a command. Ladies, listen to me. Like I said uh, last Sunday, I believe, that is a high command. That is a loving command. It is a holy command for the woman. Oh, listen, your obedience is to the one who died for you, who paid for your sins, who tasted death for you and rose again and is seated at the right hand of God for you. Amen? That's who you serve, Galatians 3.28. There's neither Jew or Greek. There's neither slave nor free. Listen closely, ladies. There's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? It means that whether you are a woman, a man, whether you are rich or poor, whatever nation you are in, if you are in Christ Jesus, gender doesn't matter it, because you're in Christ. It means, it means that we are all equals in Christ. Whether you are married or unmarried, we're all equals. I don't know why it is that, uh, and listen now, uh, and I, why is it that sometimes I think women, they feel that they're inferior to a man? I don't, I don't understand that. No, listen, Ephesians 1.3 belongs to you just as much as it belongs to your husband. The Ephesians 1 3, thanks be unto God who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus our Lord. Every spiritual blessing belongs to you. Whether if you're just a single lady, it belongs to you just as much as if you're a married woman. Amen? You're just as sealed as your husband. You're just as chosen in him before the foundations of the earth as your husband. You're, you're just as seated with Christ as your husband, redeemed, sealed with the whole. You follow me? 
just as your husband. Listen, you have a spiritual gift that God has given unto you, just like your husband. Amen? Amen. Don't ever forget that. Listen, I'm telling you, it's so important. You need to practice those things. Listen, every woman, every wife, right this minute, if you are in Christ Jesus and he is your Lord, he is taking you from glory to glory to glory. Amen? And the next glory is better than the last glory. Do you understand? The adventure gets gooder and gooder. How's that sound? Yes, you need to understand that. Wives, listen, you're just as much as fishers of men as your husband. You're just as much as an ambassador of Christ or for Christ as your husband. You've been given a ministry just like your husband too, the ministry of reconciliation. You are blessed. You are chosen. You belong to the Lord. Now listen, wives, I tell you today, I've seen it all. I, have, I mean, I have seen unbelievable things, which I don't have time to even go. I could write a book. Wives need to be where? of this, what I call a snake tactic, meaning something from the devil. And that is the devil boy, one of his favorite things to do is to deceive the woman. He loves to deceive the woman. Who was the first woman deceived on this planet? Who was the first woman that ever believed the lie on this planet? Who was the first woman ever tempted on this planet? He loves women. He loves to deceive them. Listen, so there are so many well-meaning wives. They love their husbands. They're good wives. They love their husbands. They love the Lord Jesus Christ. But here's the problem. They want their husbands to tell them what to do, how to do it, and when to do it. Now, why would a wife want that? Well, because if she does that, if she makes a decision and is wrong, She's, in, she's the blame. But if the wife says, you know what? I'm going to let him make all the decisions. If he messes up, it's his fault. Now listen, what is that? That is a woman, a wife, who finds in submission relief. Now I'm going to ask you a question, wives. Is that true biblical submission? No, it's not. And there are some wives, you know, and, and they love the Lord, they love their husband, but they misuse their God-given role. They turn mutual submission, submitting yourselves one to another into the fear of the Lord. They turn sum, mutual submission into sloth or laziness. In other words, why, why do I even want to develop a prayer life anyway? Why do I really want to dig into the scripture and study scripture? Or why should I even want to discover my spiritual gift? I mean, all God's leading comes through my husband anyway. He's, he's the one that makes all the decisions. He's the head of the house. Is that true biblical submission? It can't be. It says, remember, 521, submitting yourselves. Husband, wife, submitting yourselves. One to another in the fear of the Lord, his will. Does that make sense? So you have to be so careful about those things. So wives, it says, submit to your own husbands, and it tells us how, as to the Lord. Now listen, the husband and the wife, they, yes, they have different roles, but not different importance. Not in the eyes of God. God loves both of you Equally, equally. So the Christian wife, why does she submit unto the Lord? She does so for one reason. Jesus died for her. Jesus saved her. But it is God's divine chain of command. Amen? That's why she does it. Listen, go to verse 23 and you'll see it. For the husband is the bully of the wife. The husband is the dictator of the wife. You know, he's the... The majesty, your, your majesty. Oh, man, I can, don't send me an email, guys. Oh, listen. For the husband is the head of the wife, and here comes these great words, as also, very important, as also what? As also Christ is head of the church, 
as Jesus is a savior of the body. The word head in scripture either means the source of life, authority, or the origin, okay? Here, of course, it means that Jesus is our authority, amen? Yes, okay, whose plan is this? Is this man's plan? Is this husband's plan? I mean, the wife's plan? No, no, listen, God, man didn't ask to be the head of the house. He didn't even know he was gonna be the head of the house, all right? No, this is the plan of God. So wives acknowledge headship, and that's why they submit to God's divine order and authority. And husbands, you really ought to look at verse 23 very, very carefully, because you are to lead in your home, in your marriage. You are to act in your marriage, in your God-given role. It says, just as Christ is or did. Jesus gave himself to the church, amen? He nourishes it, he cherishes it, it is his body. So victory in marriage is found when both husband and wife, they submit themselves to God's divine order. Let me give it to you in 1 Corinthians eleven three. 3. Paul writes, he says, I want you to know that the head or the authority of every man is Christ. And the head of woman, or the source or origin, the head of woman is man. Boy, wouldn't that be great if the head of every man was Jesus Christ in the whole world? Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? It says here, the head of every man or every husband is Christ. There's the victory when Jesus is the one who is running your marriage and your life. Who has been given all authority in heaven and upon earth? Jesus who, who every tongue, every, every tongue will confess, every knee will bow to whom? To Jesus. He is the only person who has the right to rule all of humanity, no one else. He died for the world, amen? Now, with all that being said, Christ's headship over us, is it a loving headship? Absolutely, he loves us, and that's the way it is to be in marriage. So the head of woman is man. So husband, listen to me now. Never forget that your authority that you have is a delegated authority given by God to be used for his purposes, not your purposes, for his purposes. This has been God's chain of command, the divine chain of command since creation. Now listen, men, listen to me. God-given authority never means superiority. Amen? It's so important. You know, does God favor men over women? No. I don't know where, I, you know I've heard that said, that God favors men over women. I don't know where that comes from. No, listen, ladies, you know, this headship, this has nothing to do with your personal worth, your intelligence, or your abilities. This is simply God's chain of command. So that headship, again, means that man is the source or the origin, if you will, from, uh, from which woman came. Listen to the scripture, 1 Corinthians 11, 8. For man is not from woman or did not originate from woman, nor was man created for the woman, but the woman for man. Now, that verse takes us all the way back to Genesis chapter 2. If you want to turn there, you don't have to turn. If you don't want to, you can stay in Ephesians, Genesis 2, 18. Remember, Adam had named all of the animals. There was found no one for him, okay? And it says in verse 18 of Genesis 2, And the Lord said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper. Everyone say that word with me helper comparable to him we now we just found out from god himself why did god create woman it's not good that man be alone that's exactly what god says god says i gotta make him a helper i need he needs someone's gonna iron his clothes and fix his dinners and listen to him complain and make sure that i mow his yard and huh no no, listen to me. John 14, 16, Jesus said, I will pray to the Father. He'll give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. Now listen, guys, ladies. Helper is not a demeaning word. And it's been turned into a demeaning word by men. I'm telling you, 
Helper is not a demeaning word. It is a divine word from the lips of Almighty God. Man, listen, helper describes a divine function, not a worth. The Bible, the same Hebrew word there for helper, in, in what I just read to you, is the same word used for God. Where it says in Scripture, like Psalm 54, 4, God is my helper. Same word. What a divine, glorious word that is. In, in, in Hebrews 13, 6, it says, and the Lord is my helper helper. Listen, look at verse, oh, never mind, Genesis 2, 21. Let me read it. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and, and Adam slept. And, and God took one of his ribs, and he closed up the flesh in its place. The main point of that scripture is not Adam's rib, which so much has been written about. The main point and the emphasis of this verse that I just read is that Eve came from the side of Adam. He didn't come from the foot of Adam, the bone and the foot or uh, the head, none of those things. He came from the side. And then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made, or literally the word is he built into a woman. Isn't that incredible? God built the woman. That is so cool, man. I love that. And he brought her to the man. Now, that's getting ready to have the first marriage, and God is giving away the bride. Amen? So that word built there, God designed woman from man, which means that woman is part of man. The very first woman on this earth is from man. 1 Timothy 2.13, Adam was formed first, then Eve. Only Adam was formed from the dust of the ground. Only Adam, not Eve. No, Adam, uh, Eve came from Adam. Ma Matthew Henry called Eve this. Matthew Henry said, Eve is dust double refined. <laughs> what a glorious thing. He says, now, if you study this out in Genesis, you're going to notice something about when God built woman. He uses six verses. Whenever it comes to man, he only used one verse. Think about that, ladies. You did certainly got the preeminence there. But Adam was not completed. He had to have a partner, okay? It says in verse 23, listen to what Adam did. And Adam said, when he saw Eve, he said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. And so he had named all the animals. Now he's going to name his wife. She shall be called Isha, or woman in the Hebrew there, Isha. He says, she, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of Ish, or man. What a glorious play on words. So again, Adam, all the animals had named. The last person he named was his wife. Now listen, when Eve, or when Adam saw Eve, I would have given anything to have been there. I mean, first of all, think about it. They were both naked. You know what I'm saying? I mean, do, do you have any imagination? I mean, he had never seen a woman. I mean, he knew what baboons looked like and whatever else was in the garden, but he had never, ever seen a woman. And in the moment that he saw Eve, he just prophesied. He said, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. We, we would say it this way today. It was love at first sight. And when he saw Eve, listen to me now, this is so vital. He immediately recognized Eve as part of himself. Matter of fact, he was probably holding his side. I don't really know. Do you understand? No. Listen, he looked at Eve, and listen, he did not, when he saw her, he did not see her as a separate person. He saw Eve as part of him. He saw Eve as the missing ingredient in his life. He saw a gift from God. He saw a divine helper. That is, we could ponder that for hours, loved one. It says, therefore man shall leave his father, his mother, and be glued or joined permanently to his wife. And they, meaning male and female, they shall become, listen now, one flesh. He didn't, say, he, he, he didn't say, not me and you, or he didn't say, or you and me. He said, we are one flesh. You know, 
that is deeper than I know how to teach. You've heard me say it uh, from some of the other services. Listen, I love weddings. I, I love weddings more than I anything. Uh, but I don't love the part where the rehearsal, I don't like that. I don't mean that part. I only like the part when they're, we're up here. Okay? And I don't care if the bride is wearing shorts or the most beautiful uh, wedding gown in the world. But when they stand with me, I tell them the same thing as I've always said all these years. I said, when we get up there, it's just us and one other person, Almighty God. It doesn't matter who is out there, but God is about to do something that no piece of paper, no pastor, no one on earth can do. He's about to take two unique, different individuals, male, female, two different emotional makeups, and somehow the miracle of the marriage covenant, he makes them one flesh. Adam said, oh, Eve, you're bone of my bone. You are flesh of my flesh. If you're in Ephesians, I hope you are. Look down to verse 28. So husbands ought to love their own wives. Look how. As their own bodies. Why? Well, for he who loves his wife loves whom? Himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes, just as the Lord does the church, meaning the church, meaning the body of Christ. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And here it is. The two shall become what? One flesh. The most important word is in, is in verse 28 where it says, as. Love their own wives as. As what? their own body's husband as your own flesh. Why? Because you are now one flesh. That is so vital that, that you see it that way in your marriage. Husbands, listen to me. That woman who stood by your side, man, listen, she was created to become a woman of God. She was created to be your divine helper. Man, listen, that is a divine gift from Almighty God that has a divine uh, function. Husbands, you must never, ever, ever think uh, of you and your wife, uh, but anything other than one flesh. See, you're not building two lives. If you start building two lives, you're going to be on two different plateaus. It's not going to work. You know, you're not building two lives. You're building one life. When you think of yourself, you have to think of your wife. To love your wife as Christ loves the church is to love yourself. You harm her. Ladies, you harm him. You're one. You're hurting yourself. You can destroy yourself. That's when people divorce, what God hath joined together. That word means glued, permanently glued. What God has joined together, let no one put asunder. Why? Because there is a ripping that happens in divorce. Ripping. I mean, a, it, a, a, it tears. Because God has put you together. He's made you one flesh. Now listen, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ. You see, whenever a couple is married, it's a brand new something that has never, ever, ever occurred. See, here, here's a woman, here's a man. They now are about, they're individuals. They're not one yet. Do you understand? Here they are standing right before me. The vows, they're taking their vows and so forth. But here they are, they're just as she's an individual, he's an individual. But the moment that they, the vows and they, the I do's and all the rest of it, you kiss your bride, whatever, da 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 da, something happens. They're made one. Something that they have never, ever been before in their entire lives. And you know what happens? They then do something. They take their first steps together as one. Does it, do you see what I'm getting at? It's never happened before. It's a brand new moment. It's a brand new day. That's why I love marriage. And man, when they come to the communion table with me, that's the, they, they, they walk, their first steps are toward the table. They're, the first steps is to honor God. Amen? 
Oh, that is to me, that is the, it's glorious, loved one, it's glorious. So husbands, your wife is a divine helper from God. Now wives, are you fulfilling your God-given divine role and your divine function? Are you becoming the woman that God created you to be? Have you ever asked yourself, women, what God thinks about you? Think about that for a moment. Have you ever, say, Lord, what do you really, th well, I love you, I died for you, I mean, but what does God really think about you? Let me tell you from scripture, okay? Here it comes. It says in Proverbs 18, 22, he who finds a wife, and a wife is someone who's been gifted. They are a divine helper from Almighty God. It says he who finds a wife finds a good thing. Say that with me. Good thing, not wild thing. That's a song. Good thing, amen? No. And listen, not only that, guys, listen. It says, and obtains favor from the Lord. Man, you prosper in that, amen? Here's another one, Proverbs 31.10. What does God think about a woman, a wife? Listen carefully. Who can find a virtuous wife? God says her worth is far above rubies. What is God saying? That woman is priceless. Think of that. Here's another one. Proverbs 12, 4. An excellent or virtuous wife is the crown of her husband. So what is the Lord saying about women, about a wife? God just said in his word that a man's real reward in this world is his divine helper, is his wife. Man, listen, what a glorious word. You know, look back now, Ephesians, look at verse 24 with me. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in what? Let's say it again, everything. Now, I'm going to ask the wives a question. You just read that scripture with me. Does everything mean everything? Listen carefully now. Whether it, one day, if you're single right now, one day maybe you'll be married. Now listen to this. You know, mutual submission. Remember verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of Christ, okay? Mutual submission doesn't mean that when you are at the altar and you take your vows, okay, that you, sub, that you leave your brain at the altar, and walk out of here and say, okay, he's, he's my ruler. I have to do everything that this man tells me to do. I know men don't like that. You know what I mean? No, no, listen to me. Are you to submit to everything? I pastored an elder, a, a pastored, I counseled an elder of a church. Not, uh, he told me that if I told my wife that she was to become a prostitute, she was to do it. And I said, you are of the devil. That's exactly what I told that elder. Amen. But it says right here, let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And everything is a big, big word. Okay, well, as a wife, are you, uh, are women, Christian women, are you to submit yourselves to physical abuse by your husband? Verbal abuse by your husband? Well, how can you prove that? Well, you better know God's word, amen? Yeah, he, Ephesians 5, 25, husbands love your wives as Christ so loved the church. Now listen, does everything then include sin? Or you know what, I'm not gonna go to church anymore. We're not going to church. You're gonna stay home with me. I don't like Pastor Bill anyway. You know, he's a moron, you know? No, no, will you submit to that? Listen. No, you know why you don't submit to that, ladies? Because it violates God-given headship. Does that make sense? That's why you have to know the Word of God. L ladies, listen to me. Don't you ever lower your standards for any man, any man that you may, uh, that's courting you or dating you, whatever word you want to use, or even your own husband. You know, wives, listen, your model for marriage and submission, look at verse 24 again, here it is. Just as the church is subject to Christ. That means that your, the wife's obedience comes first to Jesus Christ. Amen? That's where it all begins. That is your role in mutual submission. Why? It's the fear 
of Christ. How do you do all of that? Well, you know and you learn the Word of God. See, whenever a husband or even a wife, okay, you, you have to be careful in marriage because you can exalt yourself above the Word of God. Don't ever do that. That'll get you in bad trouble, loved one. See, a woman, the greatest tool that you have in marriage is the fear of the Lord. It's the greatest tool. It says in Proverbs 31, 30, charm is deceitful, beauty's passing. That's a true word. If you know, look at, look what, I mean, when you get old, think about it. I change every day. I mean, I have hair that I'm losing and I have hair growing where I didn't think it would ever grow. Do you understand? You know, I mean, we change and, 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 you know, I know we go from glory to glory. Thank God it's into the image of Christ because I'll tell you what, the image that I'm turning into, I don't like very much. No. Listen, it says, charms, deceitful, beauties, passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, listen to it now, she shall be praised. Listen, let's say that you're dating or courting, whichever word you want to use. If you are dating a man that is not good to you while you're dating, loved one, listen to me, he's not going to be good to you after you're married. If you're dating a, 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 a men, if you're dating a woman that is not good to you in your courtship, what makes you think she's going to be good to you after you're married? It's not going to work, believe me. No, women, listen, every wife, all, all ladies, listen to me now. Women, uh, do you know that women didn't have any rights in the first century? I mean, the Pharisees, what did the Pharisees teach? They taught that they could divorce their wives, and, and the Pharisees were the strictest sect. The, the Jews believed that if anyone could ever go to heaven, it would be a, a Pharisee, okay? The Pharisees taught the people that, that you could divorce your wife. Men could divorce their wife for any reason and without any shame and without any guilt. In other words, women weren't a very, they were viewed as very low. You know, if a woman, a Jewish woman, if she wasn't good to her husband's uh, mother, meaning her mother-in-law, he could divorce her. Matter of fact, if she even lost uh, her appeal, you could divorce her. Think about that. Uh, they had absolutely no rights. You know, you, you burn the dinner, you're gone, baby. You know what I'm saying? No. But listen to me. Was that God's view of woman in marriage? No, that was man's view. Do you know, like I told the early service, I said, do you know what 2020, the, what does this year mark? 2020 marks the 100th anniversary of the passing of the 19th Amendment. Do you know what that amendment was? That it gave women the right to, to vote. Think about that. They, I mean, women they couldn't vote. They, they couldn't vote at all. Listen, if you study out America uh, uh, just 100 years ago, you know, a woman couldn't even write, have a will, her own personal will. And matter of fact, she couldn't sign legal documents. Not only that, if she made money, she had to give it over. Think about that. Because search out all those things. Those things are true. Is that God's view of a woman? No, that's man's view of a woman. So now listen to me, ladies. Becoming the woman God created you to be. Whenever God, our Father, decided to send Jesus, his son, to this world, to die for the sins of the world, who did he send this, his son to? A woman. A woman named Mary. A virgin. The Holy Spirit overshadowed her. Remember that? Think, now listen to me. God's very life the very life of God, the son of the living God, was first placed in the womb of a woman. That, what an incredible, high, unbelievable calling. Listen, women, whether you're married or you're single, you are here for a divine reason and a divine purpose. God chose you in him, meaning Christ. God chose you in him before the foundation of the earth, before, there was, before the earth was ever formed. He chose you before time. He chose you in eternity. A woman is a gift from God. A man is a gift from God. Amen? Boy, women, you need to know this. In Jesus' last hours, did he, did he run up and did he huddle himself around the men? No. 
What did he do? He found two women, two women that were his absolute best friends. Okay, that's what he did. He went to the house of Bethany. Mary, uh, it says in, in John eleven five. 5, it says, and Jesus loved Martha and her sister Mary and Lazarus. They were his closest friends. He, he loved to be with them. Listen, he only had hours to live. He went there. In John chapter 12, who was it that, that broke the, the, the spike nerd, the costly spike nerd, and, and, and uh, anointed Jesus, poured it all over him, and was wiping uh, his feet with her hair? Who was that? Was it a man? It was a woman that did that. A woman that did that. But what did the men do? Judas, well, this, this costly uh, perfume, you know, or, or whatever could be sold for much and given to the poor. And said this because he loved money. If you read the other gospels, it said that the disciples joined in with Judas saying the very same thing. Men. But what did Jesus do? Jesus said unto the men of that house in John 12, he said, leave her alone. I love that. He said to that one, the guys, you leave her alone. He said, for she, meaning Mary, has kept this for this day, the day of my burial. Now listen to me. A woman, women, don't ever feel inferior. Don't do that. That's sin. Listen, a woman knew what the disciples did not even know. She knew what she was doing. Do you understand? I mean, what a privilege. This incredible honor was given to a woman and not to a man. There was a nameless woman who was an outcast in Samaria. She was called the woman of Samaria, by the way. And she came to Jacob's well at the noon hour uh, uh, to draw water because she was an outcast. And you know the story. I can't go through, I don't have time to go through the whole story. She was married five times, living with another. Jesus asked her for a drink, and she said, why are you talking to me, a woman, a, a Samaritan? For the Jews have no dealing with Samaritans. They were the most hated people on earth, it, or in Israel. And not only that, the Jews would not even go through the, the land of Samaria. They'd go around the land of Samaria. Whenever Jesus, they're talking to her about the living water that he said, if you just knew who I was, man, I would give you living water. You know the story. And, and then the disciples, they return, and, and they, he, they said, what is he doing talking to a woman? You follow me? Really, we could read it this way. A Samaritan woman. They, man, just to touch them, you were rendered unclean. It would, better, it would be better to let a Samaritan woman who was giving birth to a child die instead of helping them. Do you follow what I'm saying? Jesus didn't think that way at all. And then after Jesus told her that she'd been married five times and was living with an old boy. She said, sir, I think you're a prophet. <laughs> I, I imagine, amen? And after Jesus told her all these things, it says in John 4, 28, oh, and the woman, she left her water pot. I love that. Went away into the city. Now listen, and this woman, what did she do? She said to the men. I can only imagine how this woman had been treated. She said to the men, come see a man. I love that. I've always loved that. It's like, you come and see a man. You come and see a real man who told, who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be Christ? Listen, what did she just say? She said, this man that I met just told me I told, he told me everything that I ever did. He told me all the things. He knows everything about me, the good, the bad, the ugly, but he did not condemn me. He did not put me down. He did not abuse me. He did not use me. He wanted me to have living water. And she says, you come and see what a real man is. Jesus is our example men. Whenever Jesus there dying upon the cross in John's gospel, the 19th chapter, the 25th verse, he said, now there stood by the cross of Jesus. Here comes the mother, his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, Mary Magdalene. Did I read any men's name? No. Why? Where were the men? 
Where were all the disciples? They fled. They ran. They were in hiding except for one. Who was it? John. John was there. Everyone else, they were all women. On Resurrection Sunday, the disciples, did you find any of the disciples who were walking in unbelief? Did you find any of the disciples weeping at the tomb of Christ? Not one. No, who did you find weeping in the garden? A woman. Only one. She was there weeping. Mary Magdalene. You study out John 20. Listen to what happened. Not to men, but to a woman. Don't worry, men. Your next Sunday is your day. In John 20, Mary was the, let me just read it. Mary was the first at the tomb. Mary was the first to hear Jesus' voice, the resurrected Savior. She was the first to see the risen Savior. She was the first to touch Jesus, the first to be commissioned by Jesus. She was the first to tell others about Jesus, that he was alive. A woman. Man, listen. I love Romans. Listen to this. Let me just, I have it marked. Paul closing out the greatest book of the Bible, the book of Romans. In the 16th chapter of Romans, verse 1, he says this, I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church of Sin Korea, that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and you assist her in whatever business she has need of. For indeed, she has been a, and here's that word, she has been a helper to many and to myself also. You read, and ladies, read it later in, in Romans 16. And he, you know, Priscilla and Aquila, he, to greet them, he puts Priscilla before Aquila. Tri Tryphosa and Tryphena, the sisters, how they labored much for them. Mary of Rome, it says, who labored so much for me and helped me and assisted me. Women, what a great place they have in the kingdom of God. But when you read Romans 16, the verses I just read, what did God do? God, Paul finishing up Romans, God entrusted into the hands not of a man, but into the hands of a woman. The Magna Carta of the New Testament, loved one, that she was going, Phoebe, her, Phoebe means radiant or light. Phoebe was taking that book, the book of Romans, to the, to the Christians in Rome. Think about that. It was a woman that did that, loved one. And then, you know, last Sunday, for example, remember what I told you? Uh, about women of the New Testament. Let me just reread it. Le uh, I said this last Sunday. I said, search the Gospels. You'll never find a woman trust, uh, treating Jesus badly. You'll, you'll never find a woman speaking against Jesus. You'll never find a woman doing anything to harm Jesus. I said, the women of the New Testament, they loved and honored Jesus. Why? Because Jesus knew how they were to be treated. Oh, listen, husbands, love your wife. That's agape, the God's kind of love. That's a command. Love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Wives, listen to me. Submit is not a bad word. Submit is a beautiful word that puts you in the divine order of God. Your obedience is to Christ. No, listen, that command, as I've already said, not only is it higher than heaven, not only is it holier than heaven. Loved one, listen, that is, that's a great command. For you are the called of God. You are not inferior to men. Not at all. You have a divine role. A man has a divine role. Get in divine order. No, listen, become all that God created you to be. Fulfill your calling. Now listen to me now. I don't know that you, if, you, if, you, if you see this. May I say to you, until the husband understands that his wife is a gift from God, and that she has a divine function, a divine purpose, and that she is a divine helper. 
your marriage will never be what it needs to be. I could not be half the pastor I am without my wife. Matter of fact, I probably would not be pastoring. What a great, divine helper, encourager, prayer warrior, supporter she is to me. Now listen, your husband, your husband is incomplete without you. Isn't that amazing? It's not good that man should be alone, God says. He has to have a helper. If man is incomplete without you, why? Because you have been made one flesh. See, a husband, a Christian husband, must have a divine helper. If not, part of him is missing. A lot of women will not allow their husbands to take his divine role. That's the unwise thing to do. A lot of husbands, you don't fulfill your divine role and you transfer headship over to your wife. You've abdicated your throne that God has given you. And what happens then? You're putting upon your wife a burden that she was not created to bear. Does that mean, does that mean Bill, that only the man makes all the decisions? Or what? What? I don't even balance my checkbook. I don't even know how much money's in our checkbook. You know what I do? She says, these are our tithes checks. These are our offering checks. I said, okay. She has her gifts. I have my gifts. Does that make sense? I need her. Listen, we make all decisions together. How? Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of Christ. Amen? Now, the bill... What about whenever she doesn't? Well, when she doesn't know, that means I'm praying more than I normally do. If she doesn't have a, a word with me from God, if we're not in agreement, the only thing I can do then is go to the word, stand on the word, and pray. The final decision, yes, then belongs to the man, and he's responsible. Does that make sense? Oh, how you need to work together. How we need to get into our divine roles. Ladies, listen to me. God wants to take you from adventure to adventure. You have, you're called of God. You're chosen of God. You're gifted of God. You don't abdicate your calling when you get married. You fulfill your calling in your marriage. Amen? That is so vital that you do that. It takes all the body of Christ, not just men in the body of Christ. With all that being said... Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for this day. I thank you for every husband and every wife and every single man and every single woman. I thank you, Lord, that they are all wanting, desiring, and obeying you to become all that you've created them to be. And that they get in divine order. They follow the divine chain of command so that they'll have a real marriage, a, a marriage God's way, Lord, not their way. If there are marriages in trouble, those here or those that are listening live, oh God, in Jesus' name, help them, Lord. Help them to get into the Word of God. Help them to uh, submit one, themselves one to another, and Lord, do so in the fear of Christ. For Lord, you made them. What a great honor it is to have your giftings in us. With all that being said, Lord, we rejoice in this day. And we give you praise, we give you glory in the greatest name in the universe, the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and our Savior. And the church says, amen. amen. Let's stand to our feet this morning, amen. Are you excited about being in church today? Are you glad you showed up, you know? I mean, you could have, you know, you could have, you know, gone to Walmart or something, something exciting like that, and, you know, Whatever you do, I don't know what you do. I mean, I'm going to go home, I pray, and, and, my, and my slave is going to have a great lunch for me. <laughs> she's not here. See, I can, she's listening to me, though. <laughs> yeah, she's going to get me for that one. So I'm preparing myself, and she'll probably have rose petals. I love you dearly, and I'm glad that you're here today, and I'm glad that you're listening live as well. 
We're the family of God. I know that sometimes we feel disconnected. That's a sad word for me now, but we're not. Nor will we ever be in Jesus' name. So let's sing to the Lord. If you need prayer when the song is over, you know uh, the drill. You stay seated and the rest of you are dismissed. Father, we give you praise one more time in Jesus' name as we sing unto you. God is so good. Yes, you are. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. And I love him so, I love him so, I love him so, he's so good to me. The Lord bless you, the Lord keep you in Jesus' name. Thank the Lord as we depart this morning.